My name is Grace Barber Plenty. I'm one of the programmers for London Film Festival and a self confessed Janelle Monet fangirl. I'm going to play it very cool, <laughs> very, very cool, but I am as excited as all of you to be here today. Uh, I will never forget I first discovered Janelle and her music uh, looking through a copy of my mum, who's somewhere here in the crowd, my mum's Vogue magazine. In about 2008, I saw this person wearing this amazing black and white suit with the coolest hairstyle I'd ever seen. And I was like, who is that? I need to know everything about them. And now I like to think that I do. And uh, <laughs> now we're here. So please join me in welcoming to the stage an actor, a musician, an activist, an author, a fashion icon. I'm sure I've missed some things because there's just endless limits to everything that they do. Janelle Monet. Oh. Wow. I'm not jet lagged anymore. <laughs> this is fantastic. They've Hi. Hi. You up. Yes. Janelle, thank you so much for being with us today and for being at the festival. Obviously, we're so excited to be closing the festival with Glass Onion on Sunday, but before then, we're going to take a little look back through your career. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. So to get us started and put us in this uh, this filmic mood, the first question I wanted to ask you, and this is maybe a big one to start with, but what is the film or films that made you fall in love with cinema? Ooh, wow. Um, so I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. Who, all of you have been to Kansas, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess in some way, because you know about The Wizard of Oz, mm. right? Judy Garland, I was obsessed, still am, with Judy Garland and... Um, but where I grew up was not at all like that. Like, no. I grew up in Wyandotte County. Um, my Wyandotte is the name of a Native American uh, princess, so a lot of indigenous roots there. I grew up in one of the poorest counties, so I grew up to, like, working-class parents. And for me, the arts always just, like, made things better. You know what I mean? Like when you grow up with working class parents, your parents, you see them working sun up to sundown, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. Christmases were, yeah, you know. But whenever I got an opportunity to be in a talent show or whenever I got an opportunity to go to the cinema, and I had parents who let me watch a lot of things. Like I remember seeing Boys in the Hood. I remember seeing... Um, you know, all of the Tim Burton movies. Beetlejuice was one of my, like, favorite movies, and I was like, I want to do that level of, like, acting. And um, I just, I don't know, I was just always like, you know, Willy Wonka, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like, all of those characters all the way down to Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, I'm a huge horror lover, and I just remember watching that with my cousins. I'm like, one of 49, I have 49 first cousins. So I grew up in a big family, so we always watched movies. We, you know, that was, that was a time for me, and it was a time for me to dream. And then once I got into, um, you know, being able to combine singing, because I loved Prince, I loved Grace Jones, I was scared of them, I really <laughs> was. I would have dreams that they would chase me <laughs> in my dreams. And so when I finally got an opportunity to, like, can't even believe I'm saying this, meet them, um, I was really scared. But they, you know, like, it was, it, it was so warming to the soul. But a lot, I think it's just storytelling in general, you know, and I, I think cinematically too. So like, even down to putting on an outfit, you know, I create these sort of characters and I think I've kind of been like this um, for a while. I mean, how else can we make sense of life if we don't, add some, you know, storytelling A little bit it. of glamour. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the film Metropolis, which I know has been a really big influence on your career. What is it about that film that you love and that's influenced you so much? I saw it right when I was deciding to become an independent artist. You know, I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to go the independent route, sell CDs out of my, trunk um, and I'm gonna write my own sort of like stage show and I had watched um, or I had listened to Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, David Bowie and I was like this is an artist who was able to create their own 
character. You know, they they didn't have to look to Broadway or everybody else's storytelling. You literally could just do that and then take that show on the road. And I think I was using him as a model. And then uh, Chuck Lightning, who is a creative partner with me, um, showed me like a lot of science fiction mm-hmm. films because he I, he asked me what genre I was into, and so he showed me this film and. He was like, you know, this is kind of like the godfather of sci-fi. You know, it's a silent film, black and white, and I had never seen a silent film, you know. And what spoke to me was how it paralleled my life growing up in Kansas, you know, this constant struggle between the haves and the have-nots where you have, like, working-class people like my grandmother who was a sharecropper and then my mom, you know, was... um, her last occupation, she was a janitor, like working class against the upper echelon, you know, rich, just that constant struggle between the hands and the mind. And I was like, this reminds me so much of just like my life, you know, and what I've been able to see and and kind of like the injustices and just that power dynamic. And, but it was centered around this android. Um, and, one of the quotes that inspired me was Fritz Lang's quote that said, the mediator between the mind and the hands is the heart. Mm. And I was like, I want to be the heart. Like, I want to be that through and through with music, through storytelling, and just, like, I want to bridge together that gap, you know. And you mentioned before that the way that you think and sort of approach music is cinematically. Um, One of the things I love about your music is these sorts of... uh, through lines that you have, you know, your first EP and your albums. I'm just curious to know, do you kind of start a project and you know the start and the finish of it and then the songs and the visuals come into it later or do you start it a different way? It varies. So like with my last project, Dirty Computer, I had a dream Mm -hmm. um, that I was kidnapped and that all of my memory was erased and I was given a new identity. Like I was in a theater kind of like this and (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Flashbacks. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I was in a theater and I had just gotten popcorn and Twizzlers and I was walking down like some steps and then this usher was like, we need to take you to the back. They're kidnapping people, they're snatching people. And I was like, leave me alone, I just wanna watch you know, this movie, I want to eat my Twizzlers in peace and drink my Sprite. And I started to, like, kind of go into, because I like to sit, like, right in the middle, like, to the right, um, for a good seat. And I was going in, and somebody just snatched me. And I woke up a different person. And I remember taking my um, iPhone voice recorder and just writing, not writing it, excuse me, uh, trying to make sense Mm -hmm. of it. And it was that piece around identity being erased that really created this this sort of like framework for the film that we did, um, which is centered around Jane 57821 being kidnapped and, and all of that. And so um, that spoke to me. Like I knew that I wanted to talk about why we were being kidnapped, what made us so unique, so special, what made us um, outcasts, what made us um, uh, I guess a threat to the status quo. I knew that that it was that it was like I needed to make sure that the community of community of people that I wanted to represent felt seen, felt heard, and that I was creating a church for mm-hmm. people who were kicked out of their own churches. You know, um, so it started there. Yeah, so it varies to answer your question. Mm-hmm. So that was like a dream, and then sometimes you have like I had a song. I was on the way to the dentist, and I had to get like either a root canal or something, which was terrifying, but somehow I managed to have a voice idea around this um, song called So Afraid. And, you know, that started with just me like, <coughs> you know, just kind of singing it and then it becoming a song. So it varies. Yeah. This is before or after the root canal? <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might not before. have been so easy afterwards. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have been able to do that song, you know? if I didn't. (laughs) It's so interesting to hear you talk about, you know, science fiction, um, especially your early influences. Um, I think a lot of people maybe think that mainstream science fiction is 
a certain way and there's less room, I suppose, for black people, for queer people. Obviously, there are exceptions such as Octavia Butler. But mm -hmm. why is it important to you to insert these people into this sort of science fiction narrative in your work? Well, I mean, you always want to... I, I like to just show respect, you know, for people who have done the groundwork and paved the way for me to, you know, have a book, you know, that just came out that featured um, five incredible writers that I got an opportunity to collaborate with, but it was rooted in sci-fi, and we were able to, like, collaborate because of... We, we were able to use Octavia Butler as somebody who had gone before us, right? And so I think whenever I have an opportunity to, to shine light, especially with this generation who may not know who Octavia Butler is, you know, just using her as an example, uh, whenever I can do that, it just feels like the right thing to do for mm -hmm. me. So, yeah. And your music is so sort of free in the way that it moves between genres and moods, the people that you collaborate with. Is it important to you to sort of not put a precise label on the work that you do, like whether it's R&B or pop, you sort of move between a lot of musical modes? Yeah, people say that a lot. They're like, oh, you're so eclectic. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, you know? Uh, like, why, why not? Like, mm. who wakes up? I, I don't know. Like, that's crazy to wake up and, like, limit what you need to do. Like, I'm only going to do this. I mean, sometimes I am like that, where I'll just, like, I might wear the same colors for over a decade, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, like, be super hardcore in that. But I think when it comes to music and storytelling, like, being able to have that freedom has been important to me. And I think early on in my career, I, I kind of used the word no. I mean, I also got, like, told no, too. You know, and back then, like, it was, like, a painful thing. Like, oh, they don't like me. Uh, I'm not going to make it. I don't have what it is. Da, 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 da. But now that I look back, I'm just like, that was great. I wasn't ready, you know. I wasn't ready. I had not decided. I hadn't got specific enough uh, about what I, what I wanted to do. And I think that even within having the freedom to, you know, play, um, there's still structure for me. Like, there's still structure, there's still vision that I need to have. Like, it's not just, yeah, there's still a, a, a structure to the madness, mm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, before we show our first clip and move on to talking about some of your acting work, I want to ask, I think people are quite often surprised when musicians move into acting, but... I always think that's quite strange considering the amount of acting that musicians are doing in music videos. Do you <laughs> consider that to be acting in the same way as you do when you're in a film or a TV show? Or are the experiences kind of different? It's all storytelling to mm. me. Like, I don't look at myself as like a musician turned actor or actor musician. You know, I think I've probably been acting my whole life. What if I am an act? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows, you know, mm. but me, <laughs> you know, who are we? I feel like we have so many spirits and so many different sides of us. Um, you know, just on a, on a deeper level, I had an opportunity to do a uh, sort of kind of healing that I, that I needed to do and around some like personal things. And I feel like, like I'm on a new life right now. It's like, you know when you get a new iOS, like a new update? I feel like <laughs> a new update. And, you know, there are certain, there are just certain things that don't, can't, t don't bother me anymore. Like they used to though. There were, you know, you, when you're kind of attached to some of these things or these narratives, because we literally feed ourselves narratives around what someone may think about us, how we feel about ourselves. Like it's all narrative for me. Mm -hmm. And um, now that like I don't associate myself with some narratives that I was given, I feel like a, like I'm just getting started. Mm. Like it's like okay, now we're here. Like oh man, there's more room to play. Like I haven't even and I'm present in a different way too. I spent a lot of time creating art, thinking about the future, the future. Like it has to work, you know, 
I have to I have to think about the future, right? But now when I'm using what is around me and I'm fully present in experiences and I'm right here with you guys, um, there's this like just new world that I think has been opened and new streamline of creativity that I'm tapping into. And yeah, I think that's like a really beautiful thing. Mm. So when I think about, you know, just what, who am I? Like characters and roles, like it's all, we're all playing, we're all in on an act. And, and I think that some people come back for the sequel some people don't make the cut, you know? Mm-hmm. We were we were just in this scene together, you know, and maybe I'll see you during the encore. Mm. Who knows? And do you think that this kind of new act of your life has stemmed from beginning to create different types of narratives, obviously music acting, you say that they're all part of the same the same part of you, but now you're an author as well. Is this creating this new world? Yeah, I'm open to everything. You know, um, I'm open. I'm open. I think I have to see it, you know, even even down to like reading a script. So for this film that I'm in, The Glass Onion, I can't wait till you guys see it. <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys are fans of murder mystery, but um, it's really fun. And, and I'm sure you probably have some questions about it Absolutely. or not. But what well, I can ask about it. That's the, yeah, that's the but question. yeah, but but I think like if I don't see it on you know the director writer can send me something and I'll say and people look at me crazy like what you just need to do it you can work with this person so but I would never want to accept something if I don't see it Mm -hmm. you know even down to a performance if I can't visualize myself on stage doing the move or like what the audience looks like and what I have on, I don't, I don't usually want to do it. I want to do things, especially now that I'm passionate about, that I'm going to be engaged with. Because when you're collaborating with people, they want, they want to have a good experience with you. And by having a good experience, I think both of you should be obsessed about the process mm-hmm. and, and the love of building it. Because once it's done, it's done. And then it becomes everybody's thing. But I think when I'm working, I like, I like to like be in love with the idea of, you know, making it happen. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I suppose it's a collaborative process throughout. Yeah. You don't just sign up to a project and then you do it, and that's it. You're collaborating the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. I think now is a perfect place, talking of collaboration, to show our first clip. Uh, hmm. What is this uh, <laughs> You may have heard of this film. Uh, this is from a little film called Moonlight. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was my first film, first on-screen debut. All right. Water for me and a little gin for you. <laughs> Boy, please. I know wine used to give you that gin, but we ain't doing that up in here, shout it. You don't think my joke was funny? What's wrong? Nothing. I'm good. No. I didn't seem good. And you ain't it. And stop putting your head down in my house. You know my rule. It's all love and all pride in this house. You feel me? I can't hear you. Do you feel me? Yeah. Okay. I feel you. All right. Woo! I've come a long way. <laughs> I must say so myself. <laughs> I mean, what a film for that to be your first film role. What did you think when you first heard about Moonlight? You know, honestly, I was, I did a Skype with Barry Jenkins, and I always have to thank Barry for giving me, you know, an opportunity to be a part of such an iconic film. Iconic film, a film that meant so much to, you know, Miami, because that's where we filmed it, to the black community, 
um, to the queer experience. Uh, it meant so much. And I, I remember reading that script, being on, on, on a, a flight before I Skyped with Barry, and I had a blanket over my like body. I remember it. It was red, one of the little Delta blankets. And I was reading it on my iPad and just in tears, you know, um, on the paper, on the page, it touched my heart. And I was like, if I'm given an opportunity for this to be like the first film, because I wanted my first film naturally to be like a science fiction film. I was like, please. And I had done some auditions and I was like, that, that was how I wanted to, you know, break into uh, the film side, on screen side. And so, but I'm so happy it was Moonlight because it meant a lot to a lot of people. I can't tell you the amount of people who saw my role, Teresa, and felt seen and felt like they could be a better ally, mm. you know, to, to folks who were trying to make sense of who they are and their identity. And um, a lot of my role was around listening. You know, I think I learned with Moonlight how to be a good listener, you know, not to always have... Um, the answer and just to allow people to listen to themselves out loud without you interfering and I think that can also you know it's a powerful tool just in, in life yeah absolutely and the role of Teresa well all of the roles in the film is so interesting because of the three sort of different time jumps in the film uh we see Teresa in two places and then I think we hear about her later on in the film mm -hmm. did you kind of have this overarching idea of who Teresa was what was going on in her life between all of those sections yeah I knew Teresa well Teresa was my older cousin you know Marlo Teresa was my aunt Teresa you know was my grandmother Teresa was like all the matriarchal you know women um, and spirits uh, in my community that just kind of took you in, fed you. If you were not getting along with your parents, you could go there. Um, so I knew Teresa well, yeah. And obviously Moonlight is such a, you know, beautiful, pure, heartbreaking film, but in one of the most beautiful scenes, you get to have a moment of such amazing comedy, which I think is the <laughs> table scene with you and Mahershala Ali, where you're talking to <laughs> the young Sharon um, when he's asking about, you know, certain slurs and you pull this amazing face. Was, yeah. that in, was that in the script or were you like, this needs a moment of a... Uh, it wasn't. That was a Janelle Monet face. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's the face that I give a lot of people that I love and care about. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it said so much with so little. Yeah, so that, I, it was, and people talk about that moment a lot, but it was, uh, I just remember, yeah, I think also having great scene partners that you could mm. just feel calm with, Mahershala, who's just incredible, and, and um, Ashton, who plays Sharon, um, his career has blossom, blossomed since then, and it was just like being with them, and, you know, Barry created this kind of this family on set, so we were super comfortable. So I did. I was just like, these are like my brothers or mm. you know cousins. Yeah. yeah. And we'll talk about Hidden Figures a little bit later. But you worked on two films kind of back to back with Mahershala. Did you know that you were both going to be in uh, <laughs> Moonlight and Hidden Figures? Or was that a complete coincidence? Yeah, I don't think I knew that he was going to be in Hidden Figures until we started filming Moonlight. And it was like, oh, okay, we're on this ride together. Mm. And we just even when I think about like that year and that like kind of span of movies and even the Oscars that year, like I went for both the films and they were nominated and I was just like, what is this? What is my <laughs> life? What is going on right now? And it was, it was such an honor. It was a lot of work though, because I had to do press for both. And like, I would have to go change clothes and you know, for Moonlight stuff and then Hidden Figure stuff. Um, and I don't even think I had a publicist at that time. I think Octavia, uh, it, who became like a big sister to me, was like, do you have a publicist? You should, <laughs> honey, you should get a publicist. <laughs> you, you, and I was like, a publicist, what, why? Why do I need, you know, these things? And so, um, yeah, I learned a lot and I just learned a lot from watching them act and I, I just think that uh, when I look at that, I was like, wow, I just remember where, where I was just in my life and not knowing how, what, you know, if I even get more jobs, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I wasn't even thinking, I was just, 
just happy, you know, and still happy to be here. And you mentioned the Oscars. Uh, it was quite an interesting year at Deeply. the Oscars. Uh, Deeply. Especially involving your film. What what was it like to be in that the most surreal moment? <laughs> it was the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. It definitely felt like a science fiction film. Mm. It was just like, we never really could, yeah, like when they announced the name and you had the La La Land folks come up and then all that happened, we were just in the audience and I think we just always felt like, wait, is this ours? Is it not? And then it just felt crazy to like snatch. And then mm. also like, it was just, it was just, it was a lot um, to consider. And um, yeah, I think even backstage, we really couldn't, we, we didn't know if, if we were supposed to be celebrating or not. It was just a weird kind of feeling. Um, it felt like a glitch in the matrix in a sense, that's, that's how I could do it. But we ultimately ended up like as a, you know, as a family celebrating that moment because we all worked hard and, you know, that film again meant a lot uh, to us personally and to a lot of people who watched it. So we definitely were happy mm. to take that award, yeah. And as you mentioned before, obviously the legacy of the film, it's only been a few years since it was released, but the legacy is already incredible. People put it in, you know, best films of all time lists and things like that, as they quite rightly should. But what has it meant for a film you've made to already have made such an impact such a short time after it was released? It's a beautiful thing, especially for the, the folks who wrote it, like Terrell and Barry. Like that was a deeply personal story for them. And I think as an artist, you just, you're always like, you want good people Mm. to have those moments and they're really beautiful people and had something to say and there was a specificity to their writing and you know there was no other film out like it and yeah I think I'm just happy for them I'm happy that I got to be a small part of it mm. but um you just yeah you always think fondly of like the people that you really like and think about them forever being able to say that I am going to roll our next clip, uh, which is from a film we've just mentioned, Hidden Figures. <laughs> Girls. No crime in a broken down car. No crime being Negro, neither. Button it up, Mary. Nobody wants to go to jail behind your mouth. I do my best, sugar. Not a great place for three y'all be having car trouble. We didn't pick the place, officer. It picked us. You being disrespectful? No, sir. You have identification on me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're just on our way to work at Langley. NASA, sir. We do a great deal of the calculating, getting our rockets into space. All three of you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, officer. NASA? That's some. I had no idea they hired. There are quite a few women working in the space program. Damn Russians are watching us right now. Sputniks. You girls ever meet those astronauts? Mercury 7? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Sir, we work with those gentlemen all the time. Those boys are the best we got. I'm sure of that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got to get a man up there before the commies do. Absolutely. Whole damn country's counting on them. That's <laughs> for certain. Hard being of service broken down on the side of the road, though. Right, right. Uh, what, y'all need a tow or something? No, thank you, officer. I, I think I got to just give me my... Just need to bypass the starter. <laughs> She's good at this stuff. Woo! That a girl. We're all set. Well, hell, least I can do is give y'all an escort. I imagine you're running late to work. Oh, no, sir, we wouldn't want to bother that you. That would be wonderful, officer. Thank you so much, sir. 
Follow me. I'm driving. Hurry up, George, before he changes his mind. We're coming. Hold your horses. Look at here. Get your move like that. me up. tell you where to begin. Three Negro women are chasing a white police officer down the highway in Hampton, Virginia, 1961. Ladies, that there is a God-ordained miracle. <laughs> and tomorrow, I'm riding the bus. <laughs> What an incredible story Hidden Figures <laughs> is. Um, were you aware of the women in the story before you were cast in the film? No, no. And it was part of the reason that I said yes. I was like, we didn't, when we were doing, you know, Black History Month even, those were not options. Um, and I was like, I wonder how many other people had not heard of these geniuses, mm -hmm. you know, who single-handedly changed the course of American history. Like these are American heroes who, obviously, if it not, you know, were not for them, America would not have been able to go into space and orbit. Um, so yeah, I was like, this is this was one of those like, I got to do this for like the ancestors mm -hmm. and just to honor those women. And now for all the people that can sit at home and watch it and learn something new. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you like the amount of even little kids too who are now their parents are so like oh my gosh little Jenny loves math because of <laughs> hidden figures I couldn't get I could not get her to do well of her homework but she saw your character and she's <laughs> getting A's now and I'm like that's great <laughs> you know like stuff like that mm. does matter you know because now you'll have a lot more um um, you know, young kids applying mm. uh, to STEM and STEAM, all of that stuff is so important. You know, I think those are like the unsung heroes who are working behind the scenes, helping, helping us uh, with technology and helping us advance as a civilization. So, yeah. And the chemistry that you have with Taraji P. Henson and Octavia Spencer in this film is so beautiful. Well, I knew Taraji a little bit, but no, we like became sisters on that on that set. Like it was deeply personal for us to honor each of of the women, and um, I just learned a lot from them. I was really nervous because I had just done Moonlight, so I didn't have like a ton of um, experience on screen, and. I just remember working my ass off. Like these women are at the top of their game. You got to come with it, you know. And taking that's when I, that's when I really found out what it took to be to be an actor, mm -hmm. you know. Because I couldn't. I had way more like like with Moonlight. I had like a little little mm -hmm. lines, and Barry wanted me to just be warm. Mm -hmm. He wanted just my essence to kind of shine through. But like we had to have. Uh, a dialect coach that I met with for like two weeks prior too because you had to have that like yes sir um, you know you had to talk do, uh, how the women talked in that time period and um, we had to learn the math so we had a math <laughs> teacher and if you know me like I love math but I also I, th I think I had ADHD growing up mm -hmm. but when you grow up with working class parents, they like, you better pay attention. <laughs> we don't have money to go take you to figure out, you know, all these things are like, now I'm like, dang, I could have benefited from some Ritalin or some something, <laughs> you know? Cause my mind was just always over here and I only paid attention to the things that I only wanted to pay attention to. And math was not one of those things. Mm -hmm. It was just like, if you didn't know trigonometry, well, you're not gonna get calculus or it could be backwards whatever so I, it was always like acting for me I love yes we get to just you know that was fun music fun 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 but when it came to math it was crazy so I had to really like buckle down and learn some of the the equations that these women had to learn wow yeah that's serious acting mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as someone that's terrible at maths I'm like 
location. <laughs> <laughs> and was it a conscious decision? Your first two film roles obviously came out in the same time, Moonlight and Hidden Figures. You're both part of these incredible black ensemble casts. Was that a conscious choice? These are the first two roles I'm going to do back to back and I want it to sort of tell this story through both of the films. Yeah, no, I didn't know, you know, that I was going to, they would want me to, to, to read for um, Mary Jackson and for that part. Like, I just, I'm telling you, like, it just, it, it feels, it still feels surreal now that I look back at that moment. I was so in it, but now that I'm looking back, and I hadn't watched that scene in a long time, and that, it was a really fun and exciting moment in cinema, and especially for actors, you know, portraying the black experience and like the black experience back then and, you know, even Moonlight, more present day, all of it was great because one of the things that that I kind of, I, I don't, well, I think I'm, I'm deliberate about it. Like being, the black experience is not monolithic, you know? Like we can be at NASA doing the equations, sending white men to space, mm -hmm. sending black women to space, shout out to Mae Jemison. You know, we can be astronauts, um, we can be in the ghettos, uh, you know, taking care of young black queer children who are trying to make sense of life and need a, a safe space. Um, we're so many things, we're so many things. And I think it was a beautiful time to show the spectrum, you know, to show all of us in a sense, like yeah. the, the yeah. So I think that that's, that's always a beautiful thing because you can change people's perceptions, you know. Uh, you, can, you can just remind people um, to further investigate when you think you know somebody. Mm -hmm. Further investigate, go a little further. And I do think that that year was such a turning point for black cinema in a way, you know, people, maybe could avoid or weren't aware of these kinds of films, but then you see Moonlight and Hidden Figures and Fences at the Oscars. You yeah. can't you can't look away from that. You see Moonlight winning Best Picture. You yeah. can't look away from that. Yeah, so absolutely. An incredible moment. So I want we've talked about music. We've talked about acting. I want to sort of bring the two things together and talk about Dirty Computer. Mm -hmm. So I want to read, this must be the most horrible thing to have a quote that you said read back to you so I will keep it very brief but um on Dirty Computer you said that uh, earlier it felt safer to package yourself in metaphors the sanitized android version felt more accepted and more acceptable the public doesn't really know Janelle Monet, and I feel like I really didn't have to be her because they were fine with Cindy I just think this album marks a real interesting turning point in your mm -hmm. career of course you're carrying on a lot of the same imagery and you know musical sounds uh as you were with your earlier music but something about dirty computer felt very different i wonder if you could talk a bit about that yeah so i i try to be on whenever i'm creating i'm honest to like where i am at that time and i i do think you know looking back it was just exciting to have this sort of like sci-fi eclectic um, mix of um, songs centered around, you know, this android figure who brought folks together and who was a metaphorical figure for a lot of people, like what it mean, meant to be othered. Um, in America specifically, and no, really globally. And Cindy represented that. Like if you felt like pushed to the margins of society, I, I felt like Cindy could be a hero to you. Mm. And as a storyteller, I just thought that was just cool. Just like being a writer and I, used to write short stories in Kansas City at this place called the Young Playwrights Roundtable and the local actors would perform it if it was good enough. So I've always had like a, like a world building mind mm -hmm. and I never saw my music career as something that should limit that. It was like, no, 
we can we can go far. I mean, David Bowie did these things. Why can't I do these things? What what's the difference? You know. And when I started to think in that way, I just I just felt better because I also didn't have to talk about my mess. <laughs> it was like I could talk about Cindy's mess and everything else going around, or, or, you know. And then you'll get some peaks of like kind of who I was. And you know, it's a, it's a, it can be a really tricky thing growing publicly because as I was putting out like these EPs, like I did a Metropolis EP before anybody even knew about the Arc Android, I did other stuff before then as an independent artist. And, but I was finding myself. I was like realizing the things that I needed to tap further into to heal the things that hmm, I didn't agree with anymore. You know, because we kind of make these agreements with ourselves depending on where we are. Like, I'm gonna only do this, or I can only do this. But then it's like, oh, as I learn more information, I've changed my mind about that. I now want to do this. This is not so scary. This is not, you know, you, when you grow up in like, I grew up in a, 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 a Christian, like Bible Belt community too, where my cousin was our pastor. So you would go to family reunions and you have to hear all of that. <laughs> and you'd hear, and then you'd hear, you know, the black like church experience, Baptist experience, you just hear like, just a lot of foolishness sometimes, honestly. Um, where, and I say foolishness, it's just like, oh, you know, you're gonna go to hell if you live this sort of way, like, and it was, it was, it can be, it, it could have been a not, not an accepting community. So when you grow up thinking these things and then you like are free from those people, then you get to decide like where you're gonna, what you're gonna do. And then there's still some fear because you're like, well, what if they were right, you know? And so once I, once I got past all that BS, I was I opened myself up to a lot more, and I started. But I was doing this by being still being famous. So like, when I was coming into who I was, you know, as a queer person, I had to do that privately but publicly. Mm. I had to have sort these sorts of conversations with my family privately, but like I'm in the middle of working on an album. Mm. So hints of, of, of who I was becoming, you could hear it in my music, actually. You can hear it in, like, Electric Lady, the Electric Lady album. Like, my song Queen, not a lot of people know this, it was going to be called Queer. Mm. And if you listen to the background vocals, I say queer. I always thought I could hear that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It's so there. It's there, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready, you know? And then you deal with the people who are like, you know, you know, and then you'll think because you, you, you know, you may be in certain spaces where there are other queer folks and you have this fear of like, am I going to be outed? And then you have to live with that whole thing. Right. And then you're just like, you know what, let me just go. I just I have to I got to get free of this fear. I got to have this conversation with my mom. And then that takes you have to you feel like you have to keep explaining this all over again <laughs> to to your family because they're just like now what now how does this make sense and, da -da 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 -da. and da -da. so it's like a whole lot of stuff that you have to balance and then you have to just deal with well I don't want people to think that I'm you know been living this lie but it's like people don't understand that no I have I'm a real like android human person on earth who has to have real conversations with their family and you know their priority over me declaring things because you want me to declare them because you think you know things but you don't know maybe you did know maybe i just wasn't ready <laughs> um who knows so it's like all this these layers uh within within art and i think with dirty computer i had i just i was like i'm ready to jump it was time to get free. Yeah. Er, you know? And you got to do things your own way when you were yeah. how you were. 
do it. Yeah, and it was it was it was it was great because I'd always I always knew I was going to do the Dirty Computer album. I just needed to like get strong enough, get my foundation together. There's this quote: um, If you don't work out your stuff privately, then you're going like you're going to be working out your stuff with the rest of the world. Like if you can't have like you know what I mean? And working your shit out with the world is just, yeah, it's not, it's not fun. So, yeah, so I got, I got an opportunity to work through some things, and I got more brave, and, you know, I got, I got more comfortable, and, and I'm actually working on new music now. Amazing. Yeah. Exclusive for everyone here. Yeah. I'm really excited, and I think, you know, working with, like, I'm more free, even, mm. you know? Um, and in a, uh, I'm centering more joy and more fun. I think a lot of even the roles that I took were rooted in some deep stuff, mm. like race, you know, um, fighting against something. And I think I, I've, I've been in this space where I've had to do this sort of retrospective this life retrospective and how how I want to live you know like really being unapologetic about what I need right now what I'm requiring of myself what I'm requiring of my team mm -hmm. what I'm requiring um, of relationships and the relationship with myself and about giving myself permission because it's like People can have opinions, right? And say, oh, I think you should do this, you do this, da, 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 da. And then you sort of make that final decision. And I think right now I'm moving in a, um, in a way where, you know, the validation is here. Mm. Everything else is like, cool, but it's like, and I always thought like I was this person that, you know, didn't, but even if it's that 2% of things creeping in about somebody, you know, thinking a certain thing, right? Or you've done all these things, so just do this. This is the safest thing to do, you know, cause I can take calculated risks. But now I'm at this moment in, in my life where, you know, I'm, I, I'm saying this now. <laughs> But I'm I'm the most free from like just like opinions, if that makes sense. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like Definitely. I'm like a now I'm like, oh no, this is the life experience I wanna have and we're gonna fucking create it. Mm. You know? I think that definitely shows in Dirty Computer. And I'd love to talk a little bit about the emotion picture okay. that accompanies it. Well, first of all, emotion picture is such an amazing title. Where did that phrase come from? I think between uh, Nate Rocket Wonder uh, and Chuck Lightning and myself, who we all three work with, we three, you know, were just like, okay, you motion picture, but it's like, with music and with storytelling, like we wanted to hit the emotions. So it's just like, I don't know, silly artist stuff, thinking we, <laughs> you know, played off a word, but, but, it, but it resonates because I think we're all trying to do more this and less this, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and it's such a great way, obviously, to do something you've been doing anyway in your career, but really weaving together the music, the acting, the creativity. And I we think, try, yeah. you know what I mean? You just like, you do what you can and you keep it moving. I'm all, I, I'm so ready to keep moving and not getting stuck in nostalgia or like what I've done. And I think a lot of, I don't know if you guys have seen the David Bowie Moon Age Daydream documentary, but I was really moved by it and a lot of the quotes um, that he said and yeah, you just got the sense that, I get the sense from me, I work better with going on to the next thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like not getting not getting stuck by your past yeah. and being a prisoner 
mm-hmm. of your past and what you've done and what you can do. Yeah. So that's just my jet lag talking. <laughs> <laughs> And here I am making you yeah. revisit the whole of your career. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. There's so many uh, other roles that I want to ask you about. However, I'm aware we are tightish for time, so I'm going to do a bit of a whistle stop tour, and I also want to make sure the audience have time to ask okay. a couple of questions. Uh, I'm actually going to go straight into another clip and then talk a little bit about that. I think it's a sort of perfect point to really bring a lot of things in your career together. So uh, I'm going to roll the next clip, which is from Harriet. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Harriet Tubman, let's get it. Yes. <laughs> Marie, will you help me? How do you do? How do you do? Good. You were confident, composed, wise enough to know not to look a strange white man in the eyes. You don't want no trouble. But if trouble comes, Again, with Harriet, you choose a role that brings to life an incredible historical figure and maybe, in the UK at least, tells us a story that we don't necessarily know about such a famous person. Uh, with Hidden Figures, with Harriet, with you know some of your other films, why are you drawn to these like powerful black stories? Ooh. Well, I mean, you know, it starts with the script. You know, like, just because it's centered around a black character, I'm not just going to do it, you know? And I think with, um, because I just wouldn't be honest to to me wanting to do things that I'm passionate about. And I think Harriet Tubman uh, is a legend Mm. and we owe her so much. And it was just my way of honoring. Some projects I take on because I just want to honor that person to say thank you. And I think this is my way of saying thank you. Hidden Figures, my way of saying thank you. You know, Moonlight, my way of of shining light on uh, a specific experience. Same with Hidden Figures. You know, you have those different moments where, or not moments, but reasons why we do things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's like, okay, I want to take this role on because I want to know what it, you know, what it, what it's like to play a dog mm. named Peg <laughs> in an animation for <laughs> one of my favorites, um, Lady and the Tramp. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have, you know, you have your reasons, and uh, I think with this particular one, it was, you know, a small role, but very mighty, and I had an opportunity to support Cynthia, who's a friend, who's from here as well. Yeah, South um, London. Yeah, Ooh. shout out to her. Amazing, amazing. And Michaela Cole, who's also a great friend of mine. I love both of them, and yeah. And speaking of uh, reasons to do things, and moving in a bit of a different direction. Yeah. Glass Onion seems like such an exciting, I mean, in a way it's a new direction for you, but in a way it's very consistent with your career, taking risks, doing very different things. As you say, you go from voice roles in animation, you're telling these important historical stories in Hidden Figures and Harriet, you're, you know, doing films like, again, voice acting like Ugly Dolls, you're never really (laughs) limiting yourself. But what was it about Glass Onion that you thought this, this is the next thing? Oh, wow. So... (laughs) When I read the script, I, I before I read the script, I already said yes, because I wanted to work with Ryan Johnson. I don't know if you guys have seen Looper. Yes. But when I saw Looper, I was like, oh, who is this director? If he ever wants me to do anything, I'm doing it. No question. I just felt that that film was a film I wish I had written, wish I had starred in, like all the above. Um, And so when I got the script, I was like, I cannot believe this is happening. And then when I read it, I was like, fuck yes, we're doing this. Grease, fuck, fuck yes, we're going. (laughs) You know, it was like, yes, yes, yes. And then Daniel Craig, I was a fan of the first Knives Out. Um, And, you know, being able to work with him, he's such a legend and, you know, wonderful actor. Um, But it was a story. 
the twist, the twist. Um, <laughs> so exciting, and then murder mystery, I'm a fan of that genre, and you know, it's one of the most fun films I've done. I mean, as you can see, like looking back, you know, some, some of my roles were kind of heavy, mm -hmm. to say the least. And I wasn't in that, I was like, let me, it's time to do something fun. It's time to do something, you know, that I think, I think this film crosses generations. I think that you can watch this with your families. I think artists, writers, I think you'll want to write, like I want to write a murder mystery. Mm. That would be my dream to like write a murder mystery, do the music. <laughs> Or Next it, motion picture. Star directed. <laughs> like, it's inspiring to me. Mm. And I say this, like, I was just, when I read the script, um, I was like, if they shoot this how I think they're, they, that they shoot it, I think, like, this is going to be a really, really, like, a hit mm. across the board. And uh, I'm very pleased, very excited for you guys to see it. Yeah. yeah so only a couple of days. I am going to open it up to the audience for some questions. Yes, absolutely. I that is what I am. I want it. I want it to be something that I write. Um, but I'm super open. You know, if it's something I can co-write and collaborate with someone on. Um, but yeah, I I know that I'm supposed to direct. I'm also one of these artists, and thankfully, I've had like really, really cool directors who appreciate the process. I have to look at the take. Like I, I look and I'm like, oh, okay. Like versus a director being like, so I need you to just do this. I learn better when I can watch myself. I'm like, oh, I just need to be more still. Okay, all right, got it. And I just know, and they notice a difference immediately. Um, so there's a part of me that is kind of acting and also directing quietly because I never want to step on the toes of the director. <laughs> but that's how you're gonna get your best from me if I can look at that take and direct myself in a sense. And we can collaborate, but I need to see it. With Dirty Computer, I have this, well, one, I have a really amazing team. Like I've been pretty much with the same creative team since I started. Like I, you know, always, run ideas past them and we just kind of sharpen each other's swords creatively and we knew the project so we were like okay um how are we what's the best way to make sure that when because you you know when you come you want to hear your songs too so we we knew we had to have like strike this balance of you have you know we know it's a a, a film it's an emotion picture how can we bring some of that into the live experience, but also make sure that I'm connecting with you guys and like, you know, performing just as as the artist delivering the message. Sometimes you just want to go and I just want to hear my artist sing my fucking favorite songs. I don't need to see all this. So we tried to strike a balance. <laughs> we tried, you know, um, and I'm happy that 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 you were satisfied. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and then also budget too. <laughs> I don't. I don't have Beyonce level money. You know what I mean? Yes. Like it was like, I. Okay, how many band members do we really need? <laughs> how many screens do we really need? You know. So. Like when I think about careers. This person as an actor, their life as an act, actor only, because I don't want to get into all this, but Johnny Depp has a very vast, like his career, like the amount of roles from the Willy Wonka to, you know, um, Sweeney Todd to all of the like dramatic roles. Whatever the Janelle Monet version of that is, mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe it's something even better, but I want to be able to do those sorts of like 
transformative characters that people are dressing up for Halloween with. Like, I'm thinking like that level. Um, I'm ready to go there. Yeah. So, You're ready to see yeah. that. Something grounded, but, you know, embedded in the hearts and minds of children forever. <laughs> <laughs> Please give it up for our incredible guest, Janelle Monet. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. Thank you.